you are about to meet a legend, a bona fide <laughs> legend, a man who's not only a legend, but also a legend in his own mind. <laughs> meet Don Demers. Hi, Don. Hello, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the lofty introduction. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Now you got to live up to it. Yeah. <laughs> I've been trying hey, to live up to things my whole life. <laughs> hey, Don, what are you going to do for us today? Uh, I'm going to lay in a seascape. You can probably see it behind me right here. It's yeah. uh, something I'm pretty well known for, and that's moving sea, crashing waves. Uh, in addition to that, I thought I'd, at some point during the presentation, just give you a, a very brief show and tell about a couple of things I have around here in the studio and even some couple of images I did back in my illustration days, just so you can know. Okay. Right. Well, why don't we do that? I'll tell you what, I'm just going to very quickly, while you're getting that ready, I'm going to just start showing some of your work because I want everybody to see just how much of a living master you truly are. Uh, just <laughs> Thanks, inc incredible, Eric. incredible artwork. You and I did a video together. We have a lot of wonderful memories about that time. And, and this, that one kind of reminded me of it. Very much. I remember those misty days up in Mount Desert when we, when we were shooting that. Yeah, um, uh, that's just, uh, I'll tell you, if you could show me how to do that, I would I would pay you every cent I make on every painting for the rest of my life. That's, that's absolutely incredible. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, that kind of harkens to a, to a classic Stobart, right? To the idea. Well, fairly that sure. He was not only a, uh, a hero of mine, but also a mentor and then eventually a dear friend. Um, so yeah, to see that art form emerge when I, in, when I was a young man was uh, just remarkably intriguing, not only the skill, but the imagery, the history. And for some inexplicable reason, I was just uh, uh, oriented toward that kind of subject. So yeah, John, I spent a lot of time studying John's work and becoming enamored of it. One um, thing I uh, I have learned, I learned from you and I learned from John is that uh, if you don't have the rigging right, somebody's going to know it. So you have to know your rigging. There are many rivet counters out there and they, uh, for some reason, they have this uh, joy, uh, they get a fulfillment from finding something wrong in a boat. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned very early on that I had to know my stuff, but I started studying those boats when I was about 10 years old. So, yeah. well, uh, you have so much variety in your work, but why don't you go ahead and show us some things and then we'll, we'll get started on the seascape. Yeah. So really, full screen. Really the, I'll duck away just to pick a couple things up. All right. There's a, I'm, I'm, I recognize the fact that I'm well known for seascapes and my marine work, but it's important to me personally to be known as a painter. And, uh, and I was an illustrator for many years first. So uh, just for the sake of general edification, I wanted to show you the uh, yeah. audience a couple of things I did in art school. Yeah. While you're doing that real quickly, I just want to tell everybody that the winner of the value specs, uh, which help you see your values, is Andrea Vistioski from Montana. Congratulations and thumbs up to Andrea. Uh, today's prize is the easel brush clip, which is uh, clips onto the side of your easel. Don, I see you don't have one there. I'm really disappointed in you. <laughs> I was waiting for my complimentary one to arrive. Yeah, well, it's coming in the mail uh, along with the check. Uh, <laughs> all right. So why don't you go well, ahead? Congratulations and to that young lady. That's wonderful. So uh, going back to the, you know, those of us who spent time in art school, you know, I was obligated to study the uh, the skeleton and all of its parts, and these are things that I still have left from those days. So my life has not just been spent. Where were you in art school? I went to the School of the Worcester Art Museum in Central Massachusetts originally, and then um, transferred over to the Massachusetts College of Art. Right. Uh, truth be told, I never graduated. I got frustrated by the faculty and some of the things that were going on, so I quit and went to see. <laughs> well, you did a beautiful job. Uh, so it was interesting studying pelvic bones and you know, all of the. So you really got to get your draftsmanship down and work hard. And at some point in anyone's career, if you decide to focus in on certain subject matters, uh, your your uh, expertise in that is built on a wider foundation than just a a narrow interpretation of a subject. I'm going to step aside here just for a sec. All right. Then I guess today to, is Don Demers. <laughs> then I went into illustration and had quite a few years illustrating adventure stories. This oh, was a fantastic. Boy, that, that really 
brings back Wyeth to me. That's oh, beautiful. Oh, thank you. This was a fellow that got lost at sea. Um, I even did kind of more formal, traditional, historical portraiture. Wow. So I had all kinds of clients. And then I also did kind of crazy things such as airplane crashes and adventure stories and all that kind of thing. Oh, how fun. So we need a know, John Demers museum. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess, I guess if you could call them my archives, they're all stuck in paper portfolios down in my basement. So yeah, uh, well, let's hope it doesn't flood. Okay. <laughs> Just two more things before I get started on the seascape. Um, the, there are uh, specific skill sets and bodies of knowledge when you're doing traditional marine arts. So when I begin to work on a marine commission, this happens to be a commission, but any painting at all, I begin with a pencil drawing like this. And right. I want to get yeah. this. Oh, that's beautiful. So that's so, what you'll send them and you'll say, okay, I'm going to, th if you approve this, then that's what I'm going to paint. That's, that's exactly right. And from there, I take it to a color study. This is an acrylic. So I adva advance the painting that way. Now, and why do you uh, use acrylic on the color study? Uh, just, just for speed. As an illustrator, I worked in uh, acrylic, gouache, watercolor. So it's just a matter of being able to get it done. It's just a practicality. This is a small gouache on another commission. So that's, okay. the, all right. that's the first thing they all see. So I also familiarize myself with the subject at that time. Um, I kind of feel my way into the painting. Uh, through, through stepping through those processes. So there are few, fewer questions for me and fewer questions for the client. Um, but again, even if it's not assigned to it as a specific commission, it's, it's just a painting for a gallery. I still like that body of knowledge to build as I'm working my way into the painting. And then I feel more free if I have a good sense of what I'm doing. So I'm a big planner in that, in that regard. All so. right. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we get started with your painting? And then yeah. I also want to ask you about your new art school, which is pretty phenomenal. Oh, and, thank you. And uh, so we'll, we'll get into that while you're painting, but I want to, I want to get this started because I know people are, are just really anxious to see what, what you're going to do here. Can you explain what you've done in your underpainting? I sure can. And what I'm going to do before I get to that, I'm going to move the camera up closer. All right. Very sophisticated production going on around here. That's all right. We're very real here. I'm we're also authentic. my own best boy. We're, we're authentic. <laughs> That's true. So I do a lot of work out of my head. And, um, and by the way, you'll probably see that the, my position on the easel might appear a little odd. It's because I've... I'm wedged here in between my palette and my uh, painting. Right. Um, but because I've been working with this, working with this subject for a long time, uh, there, is, there are times when I plan very thoroughly with small thumbnails, black and white, and then move to color. In this particular case, I just had sort of a vision of a, of a seascape. There's a wave breaking right here. So this was a little bit more spontaneous than my, uh, my approach uh, often is more likely. Um, but I was in the mood to just take some line work and get some patterns in here. Uh, so what I've done technically is stained the canvas with just, uh, there's no white on the canvas. It's just simple stains of colors. I use what I call a sympathetic or uh, har harmonious underpainting most of the time. So I know a lot of painters, they just take one solid tone and go across the whole canvas. I tend not to do that. I want to begin to locate areas. So, uh, a light source coming here. I'm using the thirds principle. To can, you, can you explain what that means? A lot of people don't know that. Okay. Yeah. The thirds principle, it's come, it's been described through various techniques. The golden mean is probably the most famous one. And then there's dynamic symmetry is another And the plain old thirds is the most pro kind of common language for it. But any given rectangle, if it's bro broken into thirds this way and broken into thirds this way, where those spots intersect are the sweet spot. It's an optical attraction area for the eye. So you kind of, I don't always use it. It's pretty reliable. It's very, very, very predictable. Um, so you increase your uh, percentage of success if you employ a method like that. Uh, the dynamic symmetry, by the way, is you strike a diagonal across and intersect it with a right angle. And guess what? It lands in the same spot that the thirds rule does. So, um, that's the rather simple compositional approach I've made, a decision I've made here. 
So back to the underpainting, it's very thin, uh, just locating images. Then I reinforce it with a little bit of a thin line. And here I just had some viridian with a little red. So these are just my markers. It's sort of my rough map as I'm getting going on the painting. Um, it also begins to introduce a particular mood or time of day. I, even at this very, very rough stage, I'm beginning to glean um, information and insight as to how I want the painting to look. Uh, it is a little odd that I do things for my imagination. It, it's probably difficult for an audience to say, well, I'd like to see a reference point so I know what the heck he's doing. Um, but in this particular case, I'm making it more difficult for everybody. <laughs> well, that's okay. We, we like that. Um, all right. And this is oil paint that you've laid down. It is. Yeah, it's all in oils. Um, I use a pretty consistent and full palette. Maybe if we move the camera around a little bit later, we can take a peek at it. Okay. Um, what I, um, but I've got a, I'll let you tell me if you'd like me to describe the colors I use. Otherwise, I'm going to step, I'll just start narrating and putting some marks here down and That's explain, painting. And, uh, explain my hierarchy. I've got, um, I'm using um, Galkid Gel by Gamblin right now. Galkid uh, Gel. Like, for a painting this size, I like a medium that dries fairly quickly. If I work on larger canvases that I'm going to be working on for an extended period of time. I like a more traditional slow drying medium that will keep the uh, surface active for me. Um, but I use, a, I, I like the Galkid gel by a uh, Gamblin and I, I do use uh, liquid. I just have to be cautious with it because it's, uh, there are a lot of us who know that it's, it, ha it has some toxicity to it that can be bothersome. So I, I use that more outside. Um, I, I love the feeling of it, but the, I love the movement of it. I've been using a lot of new, I, I, I've been kind of getting all the toxicity out of the studio and only using it outside as well. So oh, using yeah. a lot of, a lot of, you know, gels that are just basically pure linseed. Oh, uh-huh. Well, I'd be curious as to what you're using. Well, I've been using the Rubeloff, which I like a lot. And I've used oh, the wow. Gamblin, uh, which I, it's very similar. Okay. That's good to know. I'm going to remember that. All right. So what I do in my paintings is I try to build from the darker tones up. It's very seldom that I hit a light spot. I, uh, you made a humorous uh, comment about me and how I often do things backwards. <laughs> 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 uh, it, it, that's, I, I build up to my crescendos, my highlights. And it's because I'm trying to replicate natural light, um, but pigment is a reflective surface and it obviously doesn't have the capacity of, of, that natural light does. So yeah, I, I tend to find that I make adjustments and I hold back on those light spots till the end. So, so I start in this, in the darker register. If, if 10 is white and one is black, you know, I start down around a four, three, somewhere in there. All right. So I'm using Viridian and Cad Red Medium, just a touch of, touch of white, pretty transparent layers. And I've noticed having given a Zoom class or two, and in other presentations I've done in the past, I'm a dawdler. And so I want, I'm going to try to move more quickly. Um, well, I'm, you're limited in, in the amount of time you have in this particular case. We're going to cut you off at the top of the hour. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so if you're talking too much, I'm just going to tell you that. Uh, good enough. Fair enough. So you're 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 stating in a, a dark right next to what's going to be your brightest spot other than your sky, isn't it? Uh, that's right. Yep. You know, again, I'm going to employ one of those predictable but but effective uh, devices, which is to place a dark against the most powerful light, and you get the contrast, and the eye just goes to it because the the frequency of the light waves is so so dramatic; it has that t intensity to it. So and I also, go, I'm, I'm mapping out, I'm envisioning, and I'm squinting by the way. So this is, I'm still using kind of a direct observational uh, attitude because I want the simplicity in the scene. Um, I don't, I want unification and simplicity in the scene early. So I'm squinting and I'm feeling my way through these. So if it looks like I'm bouncing around, there's actually system to it because it's the, it's the efficient convenience of you get something on your brush, you may as well use it everywhere you can in the painting. And it just, so it, there's a practical aspect to it. And it also um, uh, helps with the, uh, the, the construction of the painting. By the way, Eric, is my sound okay when I look away from the? 
It, it, it is fabulous. <laughs> everything, Don, everything about you is fabulous. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm not on camera now because it got me blushing over here. <laughs> so anywhere I can find this, I spot it in. Now, these are the shadowed patterns in the wave. This way, there's also a sequence of events in a seascape. This is, this is present tense. This is past tense. And that's future, future tense. Something is about to happen to that wave as it's building and breaking. This one is in the midst of the break, so I call it present tense. And this is past tense, where the water spreads out across a soft beach or a rocky shore and then mm -hmm. attenuates and moves back into the sea again. So I'm always thinking in terms of kinetics and sequence uh, when I'm painting this stuff. You, you know, one thing that would be real nice if you could real quickly, um, Stobart taught me something about waves that I never really thought about but it's, it's simply about the shape of a wave and the angle of the light. So the shape of a, wag, a wave is kind of like the shape of a roof, right? Uh-huh. So, so can, you, can you talk about you know, how, the, how, a, how a wave is shaped and, and how to think about that? Because I think we all look at the ocean and say, this is too complicated. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm going to get a piece of paper very quickly. To, All right. I'm to sorry to distract you here, but I think it'll be helpful for everybody. I That's want to right. remind you guys to leave a comment in the comments section. We're giving away today a pair of value specs, and uh, it's a must-have. Don, I'll send you a pair. I'm sorry, Eric. I missed that. What was that? I said I'll send you a pair of value specs and an easel brush clip. Wonderful. Thank you. And I'll owe you one. So here's something that I had. Uh, I'm not sure you can see that. This is the pattern of a moving wave. And I can, rent, I can reduce it down to even simpler shapes. If a, if a wave is out at sea, it is basically a triangle. Little kids draw them like that, but it's really a triangle. As, as wind or current move water, the shape of that triangle changes. It goes from being an equilateral to a scalene triangle. Oh, I'm impressed that you know that word. <laughs> <laughs> I can get through a cocktail party and sound intelligent. That's about how long it lasts. Um, so this movement in this direction takes that apex and moves it so the triangle is no longer equilateral. As it continues to be forced towards shore, the triangle ch actually changes to this shape. That, that apex is now overhanging, so it's cantilevered, and that's the crashing wave thing that we see. So it yeah. goes from... It goes from this symmetry to asymmetrical to breaking on itself. And if you begin to see these triangles when you're out, out at sea and you see the patterns and the rhythms, the frequency and the oscillation of these as they're coming in towards shore, it's, um, I hope that could be seen. Yeah, now talk to me about how, light, how it catches the light. So because these are dimensional planes, depending upon the light source, uh, it's all geometry. If it's the back side of, the, of a wave, the, you will begin to see the reflective side of the sky, the reflective color of the sky. If the light is coming in here, this water thins out and you begin to get that translucent illumination in the cloud, I mean, in the cloud, in, in, the, uh, in the wave. So every time those triangles change, it's, you're either going to be able to see one part of the sky, another part of the sky, or ultimately you'll be able to see right through that water. So. They are, if I could fashion one more quick. If you, if you took basically a lopsided pyramid, there's one, two, and on the back side, there's three sides to that wave. So I always think of it in that stiff geometry. Will you hold that up to the screen so we can all get a screenshot of it? Sure. All right. Got it. That's very helpful. Thank you. You are welcome. I hope it wasn't too burdensome. No, nothing you do is burdensome. <laughs> so that's about all I need in, in that value and in that color. Uh, because again, for the most part, it's the backside of those waves. Uh, color is important. And I do use a Viridian and Cad Red Deep or Medium uh, very often in my, in my seascapes. Um, it, the, the trick, one of the dangers of working from your imagination is that uh, you risk coming up with 
predictable paradigms that you've used before. And I try to avoid that at all costs by being inventive. And it's, it's important to have a portion of, uh, of unknown that you're not absolutely certain about what it is you're doing. So I find that if, I, if I'm suspended in creation instead of recreation, it, at least to a certain degree, it will add, it gives you that creative experience. Um, as an illustrator, I was obligated to know exactly what I was doing all the time because you've got an art director breathing down your neck and you've got four days to finish it. But um, with, by the way, I'm, I'm using another version of that color, but I'm adding some warmth into it because it's much thinner water and it's closer to the shore. All right. But as a painter, I'm trying to become uh, all I want to say, uh, experimental, I won't say uncertain, but exploratory. Okay. It makes the painting process more, uh, more interesting, more challenging, and it, um, uh, and more fulfilling in the long run than um, knowing exactly what you're doing all the time. All right. Well, we have viewers, Don, from Turkey, from Salzburg, Austria, uh, from Italy. I'm just kind of scrolling through. Wow, good heavens. One for America, of course. You're just pulling them in, baby. Well, that's kudos to you. <laughs> no, no, that's all you. I do. All I do is show up and put you on. <laughs> well, New Brunswick, Canada. So exciting. What a one, what a community. My word. It is a fabulous community. We've all become very close. As a matter of fact, we're all moving in together. <laughs> Six feet apart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's flattering. It's, you know, we all, those of us who have been doing this. Hello, uh, Netherlands. So, so, so fortunate that I started doing this as a boy and I never stopped. Um, and I just feel, I'm so grateful and consider myself so lucky to have anybody look at my paintings. So, and to give me the, uh, blessing of being able to create them. So a big thank you to everyone. That's for sure. You're very modest. Well, hello, Netherlands, Sweden, Norway. My word. Edinburgh, Scotland. I was just there right before COVID. Boy, and I remember when I was my kids were little, and I couldn't even get them to listen to me. Yeah, I get it. I have that now. <laughs> South Africa. Wow. What age are your kids now? They are twenty-five and twenty-nine. How did that happen? I know. <laughs> Felt like Rip Van Winkle one day. I woke up and they were adults. Yeah, I'm going through that now. Yeah. How, how old are your boys? Uh, I've got three, uh, three 19 year olds, two boys and a girl. And yep. they're, okay. Oh, that's uh, right. I was thinking of three. Forgive me. Hello, great. India and Switzerland. My word. The technology is, it's, it's really something I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm reaching to them from a modest little studio in Southern Maine. So pretty remarkable. Hey, would everybody do Don a favor and uh, hit the share button because everybody should be seeing this. That would be <laughs> terrific. So I'm slowly building my way up into that light area. And I hope everybody knows, you know, uh, painting is not a, a magic trick. It's not a, it's not a show. It's just a heck of a lot of work. And under this, with this form, uh, I don't know. I, I want to be respectful. Uh, I guess truncated format might be the, Proper word. Um, yeah, I I hope to heavens that people aren't expecting to see a finished seascape out of me at the end of this. No, no, event. nobody expects that. Hello, Good. Dubai. My word, Quebec. So you've got so you get to scan that live feed as they're signing on, huh? Well, I get only if they make comments. I don't see them if they sign on. Okay. By the so, way, Don, was, uh, while you're while you're chatting real quickly, you did something which was a lifetime mission for you, and that is creating a a, a a landscape program that goes into more depth than anybody ever has. And you're you're doing it at the Lime Academy. Can you kind of talk about that real quickly? Yes, I, and thank you. That's very gracious of you to uh, to mention that, Eric. I appreciate it very much. 
Um, yeah, after having taught for many years, I, I found that the, the short workshop uh, format uh, was too limiting for people uh, because the absorption that's required to, to uh, be introduced and then understand the, all of the various um, aspects of constructing paintings, um, I began to entertain the idea. And I, I had also, of course, recognized all the ateliers that were focused on figure work and studio work. Um, so, and I saw certain skills that I thought weren't being recognized or, or nurtured or cultivated, better word. Um, so I developed, I began to develop a series of courses and turned it into something called the American Academy of Landscape Painting, where you get very in-depth training from foundational to intermediate to advanced, dealing with everything from two-dimensional design, to top topography, atmosphere, all the way to studying flora and fauna and weather. Uh, hydrodynamics, the way the sea works. So if somebody was going to be very serious and dedicated about their evolution as a, as a seascape landscape painter, this would be a place where they could attend a full curriculum. So I tossed the, I didn't toss, I presented the idea to the Lyme Academy of Fine Arts in Lyme, Connecticut, a, a very good school, wonderful facility, and also really one of the very founding uh, areas of landscape painting in the country. So it oh, has it's historic, you know, it's, yeah. it's by the Florence Griswold museum and it's got, uh, you know, everybody in the East who was anybody went to the Lyme Academy. Exactly. So it seemed a natural place to bring an atelier format in landscape painting, uh, to that geographic location. So, uh, we started the program last year. Uh, it was a difficult start and kind of an abbreviated start due to the COVID virus, but um, I did have a few few of the faculty members who were able to get people into their foundation classes. So it's living and breathing there now. It's going through some changes, but um, the uh, it will be from the next year's uh, program or this coming spring's program will be promoted in Plein Air Magazine, um, among some other places on social media. There are no other places, Don. As soon as you realize that, the better. <laughs> Yeah, I really have to work on my social skills and my right. my yes. diplomacy. <laughs> Put my foot in it again. Uh, well, it's the premier preeminent one, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're just backpedaling now. <laughs> backpedaling on the wire. I'm now using uh, Green Earth in here. Another variation on the green. Is it okay to uh, mention brand names? I think I already did. Yes, one. of course. Yeah. Um, so I use a, a Rembrandt green earth because it's a much stronger version than uh, it's, it's actually not a true green earth, but it, that's what they call it. And it's, it's just, it's got a, a, a very uh, appropriate hue for a lot of passages in the sea. And it's got uh -huh. some, uh, it's got some tinctorial strength to it too. So it works pretty well. So I'm envisioning light coming down here. You can, I hope maybe see some form emerging there. And that means that there's going to be a shadow cast here. So I'm deepening those reds. Um, Wonderful. Berlin, Germany. I'm going to be bringing a group of collectors to Berlin and Austria uh, to, uh, to uh, in in the fall. So Michael will wow. connect with you then. Wonderful. Yeah, you've had you had quite a shift from from your globe trotting around the country and all that you were doing from uh, yeah. having to alter your. Alter your approach and stay put in your studio. As I, I went from I went from broke to broker. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, India. <laughs> now, if you wanted to make sure that that water really receded, uh, how do you do that at the top of that horizon line? Right here. Yeah, is that you're gonna you're gonna basically make it lighter? You're gonna put a lot of light on top of that horizon where the light's hitting? What are you going to do there? Yes, that's one thing I'm going to do. And there's not much, this is one of the tricky things about landscaping and seascape painting, especially if you have a low point of view, which I have here. This is recessive perspective, but just three shapes. One, two, three. It's receding very quickly. Right. So I've only got a couple of inches of paint area here, vertical inches to show a couple of miles in distance. So this may not be the best composition to fully flesh out the nature of your question, but the next thing I'm going to do is start to put some blue reflective passages out here. Reflective meaning that's we're picking up the color of the sky. Okay. Um, out, so it's going to be more about 
uh, shape size than it is about a lot of planes. But maybe I'll be able to articulate that a little bit as, uh, as I get into this next passage of paint. And uh, I tend to use smaller brushes than a lot of painters that I know. I just, it's something I've become accustomed to. You know, we all have our strengths and we have our proclivities and our weaknesses. And so I've always tended to use smaller brushes um, because I've got more control. All right. I've always found that, so if I, if I have a number four filbert, as soon as I put a blob of paint on it, it becomes a five or a six. So I always yeah. err on the smaller side. So now I'm thinking of these frontal planes. You know the C so well, you can do this out of your memory. I think that's pretty cool. Oh, thanks. Well, uh, it's just been a lot of time staring at it and paying attention to it. You uh, actually went to C when you were young, if I remember correctly. Yes, that's why I, I was so frustrated. I think I mentioned I was so frustrated in art school. Uh, nobody in my family had ever sailed. So while I was in art school in Boston, I joined a sailing club and I learned to sail in Boston Harbor. And that led me to poking my way around some big traditional sailing vessels along the uh, shore in New England. So I hopped on board. I got offered a job as a deckhand. And I packed a sea bag and I took off and um, spent a couple of years, two, maybe three years off and on working on big ships. Wow. So, uh, way out at sea, I went through the Panama Canal, up the West Coast, up and down the Atlantic seaboard, I don't know how many times. So, yeah, there was a lot of time staring over the rail when I wasn't on watch, just watching, seeing what the sea did. Yeah. I've, and I've got notebooks that show the diagrams <laughs> from my sailing days. Cool. Uh, making notations about, okay, that sea broke this way. Now it's doing this. Now it's doing that. So I was, I, even though it looked like I was staring off into space, I was really paying an awful lot of attention to what was going on. Hello, Johannesburg, South Africa, and Romania. Wow, I've not seen wow. you before. Welcome. We're glad what you're a, here. What a remarkable reach you have. That oh, man. This really this thing has just exploded. It's been yeah. so much fun to watch. Well, you we know, had, uh, we did Watercolor Live a couple of weeks ago. We, it was the largest art conference in the history of the world, and we had 40 different countries attending. My word. That really is... Uh, you know, in the midst of all the difficulties of tragedy, sometimes uh, minor blessings can emerge. And this opportunity for people to be able to reach out and uh, teach one another and share things with one another is really. It is wonderful. Yeah. Well, and you're going to be teaching on Plein Air Live, the next conference we're doing in April. I am. That's exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. Yeah, I haven't been involved in it for a while, so it'll be great to be back again. Well, you were involved in the plein air convention. So uh, we're still doing the plein air convention, knock wood, but uh, who knows what's going to happen by May. Yeah. But, uh, mm -hmm. It's going to be great having you on, uh, on plein air live too. Hello from, hello, Spain. So now I'm taking this because as I said, water can be translucent, transparent, totally opaque, uh, fluid, aerated. So there's all these various layers that go on top and within these passages. So again, I'm doing this in a very, very quick. It kind of looks like that color you just laid on is a, looks like it's a real cool, is it almost like a purple? Yep, you hit it right on the head, good eye. It's a ultramarine, ultramarine blue, excuse me, I need a drink here. I'm getting a. It's hard to talk and paint all, in front of all these people. <laughs> Argentina. I'm getting more nervous by the country. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm doing this in a rather rough and very expedited way. But so I'm hoping that the narration helps kind of fill in any blanks or mysteries. But so in You're terms of better than, than than I could ever do just <laughs> even at that stage. So well, thank you. So I'm laying a, an additional plane onto the depth, onto the con cave shape of that wave and i'm doing it with that purple color that you identify ultramarine blue and cad red deep i'm also holding the brush and i twist it it's it, i very seldom hold the brush like this i'm i'm dragging it i'm twisting turning and I'll, it's it's allowing the paint to kind of pay off the surface outstanding so so you got about 20 more minutes 
dang, I got some moving to do. Yeah. So I'm going to, um, pardon me one sec, slight delay here. I'm trying to spot that brush I had a moment ago and I've misplaced it. So I'm just going to take another one. So since that's the case, I'm going to make sure that I just get this thing covered with all the general shapes. And the first thing I've got to do is where this plane has changed. It's now in this um, front segment of the painting. I'm gonna have some water moving over here. And I do use this other weird color. Anybody out there who's taken my workshops from me, they've heard me mention this color over and over. It's called Greenish Umber by uh, Rembrandt. Uh, it was introduced to me a long time ago. It just, it's particularly useful in, in, uh, in New England where there's this, uh, this thin layer. I've noticed from having painted everywhere from Florida to Hawaii, Mexico, and the Caribbean that I have to adjust my palette pretty dramatically because I'm very de I'm not dedicated to me or my style. I'm dedicated to my subject matter. I figured since I'm painting it, I'm going to show up anyhow. So, Joe um, McGurl introduced me to green Greenish Umber, and I, I put it on my palette since then. Uh, well, that's pretty funny because Joe and I were on a painting trip with Billy Davis about 25 years ago, and Billy had the tube. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so now I know where the history comes from. Yep. So he handed it to me. Or I don't know if he gave it to Joe first or me first, but we both started using it and haven't stopped. <laughs> yeah. Greeny Schumber from Rembrandt. That's it. Yep. There are other companies that make it, but it's not the same pigment at all. It's not yeah. the same hue, rather, I should say. So now I know that there's a reflection from that foam pattern right there. And when I'm concentrating, I can paint pretty quickly, but this... You're doing great. Oh, thanks. Appreciate that. If, yeah, if you guys way, agree, hit the like button or a heart or something. I'm sorry, say that again? I said, if they agree that you're doing great, hit a like button or a heart or something. Oh, oh, thank you. Good, good, good. Great. So that's going to be a reflection of that. This, this tone is going to change even more because it's picking up the light from up there. So there has to be a transition from green to purple to that lighter glow. So Do you I'm ever go somewhere where you paint the water and it's just so totally, you have to just completely change your palette? Totally. One once was in Southern California and once was in Hawaii. And I just, ha I had to buy a, a cobalt turquoise and, uh, yeah. and my uh, old friend, John Butison, he was watching me fuss over it. And he's just, cause he's a quiet fella. He just came over and handed me a tube of a, a turquoise something or other. And he said, here, just take this and be quiet, will you? <laughs> yeah. Well, I found that at Banff. I took a group up to Banff and Lake Louise and, and it, you know, the water was just glowing turquoise. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so I've got those sort of ancillary, ancillary colors in my box that I don't use often, but when you need them, boy, you need them. Cause I don't really use color relativity as much as I use pure color. Um, painters that you paint by color relativity can make those make adjustments. They just like you accommodate it one way or another. Um, Here's a question from Kirk Larson who says he's watching from Hicksville, New York. Question for Don, follow up on a question from Sal McGundy demo. Now that you're demoing, demoing worldwide via technology, do you still consider yourself a Luddite? <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew Don't that. Answer. Don't answer it. <laughs> uh, Very funny. A forlorn, forlorn Luddite. Forlorn, yeah. yeah. Eventually, you can't beat them. You got to join them. <laughs> well, thanks, Kurt, for watching. <laughs> what a tight knit community this has become. It is. It is. When I had the opportunity to try, have had the opportunity to travel to the various painting events, and then the honor of judging shows around the country, uh, we're really a bunch of traveling Bedouins. It's such such a joy to see each other. Gypsies. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, well, that's why I created the uh, the Publishers Invitational up in the Adirondacks in the Fall Color Week, because I know a lot of people go to these plein air events and they travel to the events, but they can't paint together because they're competing for, you know, for selling a painting. Yes. Mm -hmm. and so we just get together and, and hang out and paint, drink beer and whatever, and, and uh, play music at night. We have a lot of fun. You should come up. 
You know what? You, I recall you inviting me to that before, and uh, I have been remiss in not accepting the invitation, but that sounds you're a, busy, you're a busy guy. Well, just know it's a standing invite. Uh, the idea of painting with friends and having a drink or two and playing a little music at night sounds just about perfect to me. It is about perfect. Yeah, this is our 10-year anniversary. Now, you're cool? laying in sand now. Yes. What have you What have you done with the color there? It's, it looks like kind of a warm gray. It is. Yeah. I took the green. I migrated from the green, added some of the purple tone into it that I had used in these reflective uh, planes. I continued to warm it using uh, um, burnt umber and a tiny bit of burnt sienna. Um, so it's going to be have color harmony, color dialogue with the sky, but I, I don't want it quite as bright as that. I yeah, always yeah. value hierarchy in my paintings. Well, I hope you have time to lay a little of that light in the back and lay some of that sky in because I'm curious to see what that looks like. That's that's what I'm going to do next. Um, yeah, this is actually, fabulous. How, how am I with time, Eric? Well, uh, for, you got about 15. Okay. So let me get these foam shadows in here because those are important. Uh, All right. Frederick Waugh, the great, great seascape painter, you know, you can't really hang your hat on a lot of adages, but sometimes there are some that just ring true. They got so much resonance. And one thing that he said was, you can often unify a seascape if you use the same coloration in the shadow of the of foam patterns as you do in the sky. Um, just builds up. So uh, I, do, I paint um, in the hierarchy of using, what do I call, I'm looking at my note because I've, I've forgotten it for a moment. Empirical uh, to inventive and to academic. So empirical painting is basically a fancy way of saying from direct observation. Um, and I've seen repetitious patterns over and over and over in nature, but you can never ever forget that there are always anomalies. There are always aberrations that occur that uh, give, give uh, nature its infinite variety and, cha and challenge to us as painters. But, uh, but, but there are principles. There are, there are, uh, that might be a little too blue, but again, I got a lot of fish to fry right here, so. I'm glad you used a sea analogy by using fish. <laughs> oh, a very, very active, complex mind I have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just pelagic by nature, Eric. So <laughs> I'm, I'm warming this tone up a little bit because I know it's reflecting off that sand. Again, every time I can picture a plane changing, I, um, I consider change shifting a value and or a temperature right there that would have more warmth in it than this, than this would here. Mark Shasa says, uh, you're the best painting teacher of them all. My word. Well, that'll have me walking with a strut later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. What a fine compliment. He's Wonderful. a good painter, too. He, he is. And if I can return a compliment, a very fine guy. Yes, he is. So now I'm placing these. Nothing's random. There's, all, there's order to all of this. I'm thinking about how these planes drop in and water to further the description of water's nature. Uh, it goes from order and rhythm and pattern to moving chaos. And so... As a seascape painter, uh, I think it's important to understand the, the structure, um, the architecture, the rhythm, and then you have to let yourself go and start feeling that sea. So that's, I guess, if I were to identify my pad, my process in one specific way, that would be it. Um, uh, Montague Dawson, uh, those of you who don't know, he was one of 20th century's great, great uh, maritime painters, primarily known for open ocean scenes, clipper ships and the like. Uh, his seas were painted very wildly. And then he would kind of corral them with surface pot patterns and textures to make, to have the form appear. Um, really exciting when you look at the juxtaposition of wild, expressive moving paint against the uh, subsequent, uh, uh, what would you call it? I get not anecdotal, but, uh, identifying marks on top that, that turn it into a believable C. Keeping that a little bit warm. Try to go with, if there's a major, again, I didn't break this half and half. 
there's a major area here, uh, small bits of light will be introduced. And, and if there's a light area there, small bits of this midtone will be introduced over here. But there's, there's something else besides perspective that goes from foreground to background. Perspective goes from side to side. Uh, it will change in its atmosphere and its light diffusion, its light refraction. And because of that, color shifts will occur. Value shifts will occur. Well, I'm getting ready to go to Florida. I'm going to take my paint. So now I'm inspired. Oh, good, good, good. Oh, you know what? Hold one sec. John decided to go off to the refrigerator and get a beer. <laughs> uh, George Van Hook. Hey, welcome. Look at that. Hey, oh, it's a Florida piece, Florida. huh? So this is a stu morning study I did in Florida a couple of years ago. Very nice. Just watching those big majestic clouds scoot across. And yeah. um, had to make sure I shifted my palette to that one. What's George doing? He should get back to work. Yeah, get back to work, George. You, you, you're you just being lazy watching TV all day. <laughs> Boy, if you wanted somebody to paint fast, he's the man. Yeah. Well, you know, he's got more paint on his car than he does on his paintings. <laughs> <I know. laughs> he buys more tubes in one year. One one season, then I buy in ten years. <laughs> he probably gets them for free, you know. If we, everybody wants to have well, them use the paint, use their paint. So now time. I'm pulling that off, trying to get uh, some atmospheric movement, a shift from here to here. I'm going to refract the light a little bit over under the over under. How's that for contradictory? Over on this side where it's warming up from the sun. What are you painting on? What is your substrate? Oh, this is uh, Clausen's number 13. And it's uh, on a board? Uh, no, this is stretched. Stretched, okay. I go back and forth there. I use a lot of the uh, source tech panels and uh, some Raymar, but uh, occasionally I make them myself. But um, sometimes I, I like, if I'm doing a seascape, I like the bounce of the canvas. If I'm doing a traditional painting that's got a sailing ship or something, or even something with architecture, I tend to work on a panel. Um, so I, so I, I can have a lot of accuracy with my mall stick and all that kind of thing. So does the bounce on the canvas make your painting feel freer? It does. Ab yep. Okay. And there's, uh, there's a kind of a esoteric term. You see it so much in Russian painting. It's, it's the empathy for the painting, the feeling for the painting. Um, it's way beyond craft. And, yeah. uh, and we have these symbolic experiences that can increase our empathy, our sympathy for what it is that we're working on. And it, uh, so th this is uh, just this feeling of it, uh, like petting a dog, you know, just um, it can it can create a different atti attitude for you, different sense. I uh, posted on my Instagram story today uh, a, a, a preview of the Russian museum in St. Petersburg and a, a rep and show that I went to this year. And uh, it's phenomenal. The Russian painters just, they're incredible. They sure are. Um, We're I'm taking a group of uh, 48 people to uh, Russia this fall. Wow. That, that's a big gang. Yeah. Well, I couldn't, I, I, I could have sold a hundred seats, I think, but I, uh, we're going to small villages where there's no hotel rooms. Okay. I had a great joy of being in Russia back in, uh, 90, uh, 99, 2000, right in there somewhere. And, uh, of course going through the Tretyakov gallery. And as soon as you start laying your eyes on Shishkins and Repins, uh, and, oh, I and, Le and Levitans, I mean, it's just a game changer. Yeah. You can, you can stare at them all day. You just can. Trying to figure yeah. out what they did. And you know, you can, get very inspired or you can just go home quietly and make a small pile out of your gear and burn it. Uh, <laughs> so it's a, it's a pivotal point, but Oh my word, it, it was, I said, how, how, how did they take hum How did they take humanity and shove it into a tube paint, a painted tube? Yeah. Uh, it's just the life force in that, in those paintings. Is <laughs> well, most people who haven't seen Russian paintings in person haven't, haven't really seen paintings. It's just, it's just, it's an experience unlike no other. And it is, yeah. And if you were to look at a Shishkin on, on a small reproduction, they look a little fussy and tight. But when you see a 14 foot high canvas and the bark is breathing on those trees, it's just, uh, 
Yeah, you know, he he must have used long brushes because I know Reppin used long brushes. Uh huh. Yeah, that that's curious. Gonna, I wouldn't have known anything about his working methods. We're gonna go to uh, Reppin's home and studio. We've got a private tour there, and we're gonna we have a private uh, private tour of the Hermitage where when it's closed. We've got a well, lot of cool stuff happening. <laughs> I met a couple of people over the years. You got you got some connections there. I'm tracing a sl slight highlight across this. This is a little tricky for me to paint because I'm literally leaning over the table where the uh, camera with the where the laptop is with the camera in it. So uh, it's a bit of a challenge, but that's okay. Yeah, it's not that's, easy. That's, that's showbiz. And I also begin to build up thicker passages of paint. You know, at first I'm just putting, scuffing off transparent layers. But now at this point, I just start laying on bigger, thicker oh, nice. pieces of paint because the paint has a reality itself. It's yeah. not just the illusion that I'm after. The paint has an identity. So it, it pushes the picture to the next level, hopefully anyway. I'll tell you what, Don. Yeah. Uh, are you up for extending for a few minutes? Oh, sure. Okay. If you guys are up for extending for a few minutes, I'll extend it to give Don a little bit more time. But here's the deal. Um, if you are watching this on some platforms, it may cut out at 60 minutes. And so if, you know, if it does, you can find us on YouTube uh, at Streamline Art Video, on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Make I think it cuts off at one hour. And I don't know about Twitter and Twitch, but uh, anyway, you, you'll find us. If not, you can watch the replay. All right. But here, Don, I'm going to just take, take, give yourself 10 seconds, give yourself a breather, step back, have a beer. I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm going to play something really quickly before people go. All right. Painting outside is fun and everyone is doing it. It's a great way to make new friends, be creative and enjoy the outdoors. But painting outside requires different skills than painting inside, and it helps to learn it from the best. Monet and the Impressionist called it plein air painting, and the movement is bigger than ever. Now thousands are going outdoors to paint. Once you master plein air painting, your paintings will be transformed because you'll learn to see light, color, and form differently. At the second annual Plein Air Live, a worldwide virtual online art conference, devoted to plein air painting. Three days of world-class artists demonstrating various techniques for outdoor and landscape painting. You'll get to know other artists and instructors personally through our breakout sessions, and we'll even paint together at the end of each day. This year's faculty includes Kevin McPherson, Kathleen Dunphy, Joseph McGurl, Camille Priswadek, Christine Lashley, Michelle Uzabelli, Dawn Whitelaw, Lori Putnam, Dave Santianez, Bill Davidson, Don Demers, John McCartan from Australia, and more to be announced. Get private access to our exclusive members group to become part of our community and learn to take your artwork to a higher level. Plen Air Live, April 15th through the 17th. Sign up today and join the world as we learn art together. And for people who want to learn painting from scratch, start with our Beginner's Day on April 14th. We'll teach painting in different mediums like watercolor, gouache, pastel, acrylic, oil, and we'll teach subjects like trees, clouds, mountains, water, and more. You'll see your artwork get better faster as you learn from top artists from all over the world. Make history as part of the Worldwide Art Conference, Plen Air Live. Sign up today and join the world as we learn art together. From the publishers of Plan Air Magazine. Okay, while well, you're back, I should mention that the price is going up on the 28th of February. You can save a bunch of money if you just get that done. That's plenairlive.com. We decided to do it in April because... For two reasons. Number one is everybody needs to get tuned up before they start going outdoors to paint this summer uh, once we're allowed out in mass. And secondly, um, uh, 
we don't know if the plenary convention is going to take place or not. We hope so, but we wanted to make sure you're, this is kind of like spring break for our, our spring train. Okay, Don, you're back. All right. Thanks for the breather, Eric. I appreciate that. Yep, um, you need to be able to step back once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't do that often enough, especially when I'm teaching. Um, so what kind of a time frame do you want me to work under here? Oh, how much time do you need? Oh, 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, we'll go till uh, quarter after uh, or, or 10 after. We'll just see how it goes. But uh, you guys hang in there if you can. Thank you for your patience. We normally don't run long like this, but this we just we can't miss this. This is too good. <laughs> well, thank you. I certainly appreciate the the consideration and in the uh, in uh, toward me and also the interest that you have for what I'm up to here. So uh, that. Does it go unrecognized? Um, okay, Don, because we have so many people who have tuned in since you mentioned this, somebody asked if you have a school, an online school. So just briefly, will you just tell everybody again about your academy? Yes, it's called the American Academy of Landscape Painting. And it is hosted by the Lyme Academy of Fine Arts. So if you go to limeacademy.edu, uh, look on the menu of their homepage, and there you'll see listed as one of the offerings is the American Academy of Landscape Painting. Uh, and then the, all, the, all the class offerings, some are, some are live, some are Zoom. We also did a, a, some brief pre-recorded videos when COVID hit, so that was another alternative. So you'll find all those there. Um, the foundation classes are being taught by a variety of students, but some local um, graduates of Lyme, uh, Jacqueline Jones, Eileen Eater, um, uh, Jerry Weiss is there. Um, I, I probably shouldn't start naming them because there's too much. Zufar, a big boss. You're going to forget somebody, then they're they're going to be really angry with you. I know. <laughs> Joe McGirl teaches a master class, so I got that out. <laughs> so you'll see all the offerings there. Um, uh, uh, Rick Lacey does a good figure drawing class. So there's a and uh, so the part the plan was that you can that you need to go through the whole sequence. You've got to start with foundations unless you present a portfolio and the faculty decides that you can skip some of those and move on to the intermediates and or master classes. By the way, I just broke that horizon with a little bit of foam just to keep, uh, to have that little bit of uh, interest and to break up that, the, uh, the horizontality of that shape right there. So anyway, yeah, back, back to that, the American Academy of Landscape Painting, and you can find it on Lime Academy of Fine Arts website. So thank you, Eric. That's very, very thoughtful of you to. Uh, you no, know, I, I, I have. I don't endorse anything, Don, because I always get in trouble when I do. Yeah. But I, I do endorse this because, uh, first off, I, I know your hearts, and I know that your intent is to teach people, and this is not about getting rich. This is about making sure people get the the important principles. Yes, that that is it. Because it's pretty hard to become a multimillionaire when you're painting for a living. Um, uh, and or teaching. So there's another motive in it, uh, clearly another motive. And it's, it's the love and passion of what we do. So, and the desire to share it. So um, it's, uh, it's gratifying and it'll be very exciting and gratifying uh, with the, uh, as COVID subsides that um, the, the program will have more life to it. So now I'm putting these foam tracings around uh, feel free to keep any questions or dialogue coming, Eric. I, I will. Okay. It's not going to not going to slow me down from from painting. My hands moving pretty quickly now. So uh, I don't want to take up the time to go over all the components because I think they're pretty self evident. But what I'm doing now is it's this next layer of activity that you'll see on in moving C. Uh, this is going to these begin to be the adornments and uh, lay the brush down and I do some twisting. I used to be a little bit too careful in crafting a C and they look too rendered. Now I like to have more edges lost. I watched George Van Hook paint a couple seascapes and a little light went on. <laughs> Did you get any paint on you when you were in paint? Oh, there's a splash zone around him. That's for sure. You got to put a poncho on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, we had a really nice time. I have a painting in here that we did at, um, in, at Mount Desert Paint. It was, I think it was Bar Harbor. And do you remember that day? It was you and me and Elaine Bassa and uh, I'm not sure who else, a couple other people. Just say yeah, you remember. You probably don't. And Mary Erickson, I think, were all involved in Mary that. Mary Erickson, that's right. 
Yep. That was a fun day. That was, that was, that was a good painting trip. So now I'm, this is just this scumbling dragging to pick up. I'm, and I'm getting a little out of sequence. So I'm going to, this, this stuff gets a little seductive and it's fun to start moving around, but I still got more important things to place that, that main highlight. But while the, while the paint is on the brush, I just trace it along the surface. And this can get, it can be quite awkward at first. It takes some practice to get those, the foam tracings to lay. William Trost Richards was a great example of it. So here's another, you know, I'll hold the brush and roll it like this. This is the leading edge of this water down here in this corner. I also push the other way, drag, pull, because the sense of movement is so, so, so important. I'm not painting, I'm trying not to paint a picture of the sea. I'm trying to paint a symbol of it. And I often have very big, and you'll see them here as I'm putting them. Sometimes the marks are just, just what you want. And other times, probably more often than not, you just got to work the thing um, to get the delicacy that I'm after. Scale of the marks is a big, big, big uh, theme for me. Uh, making sure that, was it Delacroix, begin with the broom and finish with the needle? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I... I think of that all the time. Um, Ken Oster used to take that literally. I mean, he literally painted with a broom. Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I painted with Ken many times. And he used to make more fun of me. Uh, when I, I'd see the way he'd start a painting and he'd, he'd watch me and he'd say, you're the most anal painter I've ever seen. <laughs> we were all together that, that uh, week. We shot your video. He was there and. Yep. A whole bunch of us were, that was a lot of fun that week. That sure was. So now I'm going to go on. There are some edges. This is dotty and it's, you know, it's not, it's clearly not formed the way I will have it ultimately. But uh, yeah, that was quite a confluence of talent up there. Uh, yeah. All of us sort of packed in shooting the videos and Papa was up there and um, there were some other folks. Kate Starling, she, she was a hoot to paint with. We had a lot of fun. We, that we did. We're lucky to be in the biz. And you see the, I always think, my God, I'm the luckiest guy on the planet. I have friends all over the country and I can just take my paint box and go visit. And uh, so here is going to be where I want there to be considerable impact. This is where painting the low values in first helped me um, because I've, this gives me room for this little punch. I haven't really fussed with ed edges yet. That, that's a caress uh, and a consideration that comes after I've built the thing in somewhat. Right. Obviously that's an awkward line, but you cut back into it and carve it and weave it. And I love the fact that paintings are they're just big puzzles and they go shape to shape, two dimensions first, three dimensions secondly. And, um, and it's, it's a um, linear process to a spatial solution. You go step after step after step. And, um, I usually breathe three times in any given painting. Once when I start, once when I know I haven't screwed it up, and then once when I put the brush down. Um, everything else, I'm suspended in a state of concern. <laughs> and after the architecture of the painting is well on its way, then it's the, paint, the paint process becomes more discerning. The brush shouldn't be as active and the brain should be more. You really just want to make sure the next mark you put down is the, pro is the appropriate one. And anytime there's a chance to connect on any painting, any subject, landscape, seascape, figure, still life. So I'm, I, what my intention will be to slowly make connections with this uh, linear pattern of these, uh, the breaking foam. Too much coffee this morning, my hand's shaking around. And these highlights weaken as they get away from the light source. Pretty, you know, basic stuff. Well, you also, I assume you want to kind of keep your brightest light in your focal point. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yes. For the most part. Yep. Um, and I'm going to come in here and punch some of these luminous greens uh, again to uh, comment on the fact that I do things in kind of a reverse way at times. There, here's a lot of topography. So this has concave, convex, I mean, a, a convex, concave, convex. You're just tracing it over the tops of these things. Takes a dip, 
then leads up on the other side. This is just, I, I just don't, you're bringing tears to my eyes, Don. <laughs> I came on to make you happy. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. I know there was an elegant compliment in there. Value drops just a bit. Again, construction, topography, it drops, it folds, it shifts, it moves, it twists. And if you think you can get this right the first time, every time, I, boy, you're a better painter than I am. Um, what is the size of that canvas? It looks like it's about a 12 by 24. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. Yep. Right. Little scuffing, a little scumbling. Um, so brush shape is important. For the most part, I use filberts, but I, I use the round to craft that highlight in there. And now I'm going to use a small flat. I and it looks, what kind of brush are you using? It looks like a bristle. Yeah, bristle, signet, Robert Simmons. All right. I like Raphael's too. Silver brushes are pretty good. So Hello, I was Scotland. Reminder, you guys, leave a comment. Tell us where you're from. You might win a pair of value specs for today. They're glasses that help you see values. Good training tool. You that identifying value accuracy and value accuracy and value hierarchy in the orchestration of a painting is absolutely essential. Uh, if you don't have a clear vision of the of how how wide a value range you want and where you want it placed, it's really hard to construct a painting. I I can't emphasize enough. So, what do you mean by value hierarchy? Can you explain that? Uh, yes, simply in this is that I wanted to key that dark in there. Uh, and because that will be a point of, um, to arrest the eye. Uh, if you come up a bit in value in these different places, you want them to build upon one another, but not compete with one another. So if I had say, the same activity with the same dark over here, I've diminished this effect. Um, the other aspect of it is that if you have a, a shadow highlight, a, a shadow value that's too light, versus a highlight that's a little too dark, the form won't become apparent. So it's always this relation. And I scan my paintings like this with one eye closed, looking for value triads everywhere. And then I look at it in its entirety to make sure that everything is either subordinate to or advancing the form and the, and the composition and the piece. Um, I, I've seen a lot of painters who get very excited about the detail well, I got to knock off the coffee. My hand didn't usually shake like that, and I'm not nervous. Um, uh, I see a lot of painters, they get excited about the, uh, the, um, the surface detail, the, the minor themes of a subject, and they forget about the form first. And, it, you know, it's basic stuff, but it's stuff that you really requires a lot of training. You know, of course, Frank Riley and his very disciplined approach toward uh, uh, value understanding, doing the value scales and all that. Um, the guy that taught me was a student of Riley's. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So I have a Riley palette behind me. Oh, oh, very cool. Can't get better training than that. By the way, back, back to the, the flat, the reason I'm using it is to go across forms. I don't want the Somebody told me something the other day that I never knew, and that is that if you go horizontally, a brush stroke will show up much better than it will vertically. Absolutely. Yep. If you want form in a face, you know, you pull down on the cheeks and then you cut across the cheekbone with a perpendicular. And the same thing happens on this. Very same thing happens here. The paint has more physical presence and it catches the light. So. I shouldn't be talking about figure painting, though. I haven't done much of it since my illustration career. All right. Well, come up to the Adirondacks. We do portraits at night. Sounds great. Would love to. I know you're going to be busy teaching, but you're always welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not going to be teaching full time. I'm just going to be down there giving a couple of classes and All just right. overseeing the curriculum. I want to make sure it stays on the course that I originally envisioned for it. Well, you come up, you come up to the lake in August. We've got these incredible sailboats on the lake that they're about 100 and 
20, 130 years old. They're just are they the, are they the Edoms? Item, item, yeah. Item, I had the pronunciation wrong. Those so there's are only 12 in the world, and uh, 11 of them still sail every every Wednesday, uh, every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Oh, that, that would be a sight. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. With the big mountain behind them. It, it's it, nice. I D E M. I D E M. So I, I knew of them, but obviously not well enough. They are gorgeous boats. And you can make a choice. You can either own a house or you can own an item. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough choice. <laughs> So now I'm doing a little bit more of the scanning, and I'm, I'm getting pretty close, Eric, to where I think that's about the first lay-in. Uh, if there's anything that you or anyone see that is bugging them terribly or they like some more explanation of or a resolution to. Uh, well, I was really curious about one thing. You know, you've got that glowing light, that viridian green in the wave on the left, and uh, the dark really makes it pop, and then you laid a white on top of it, but you've got a little bit of a dark in there. If that were darker, would that not read right to make Are you it talking about in here? No, up in the green area, up in the light green area, over the left, left, right, down, right there. Right there. So you got the light meeting a slight dark, and then you've got the light again. Would it glow more if it were darker? I'm just curious. It would glow more if it's lighter, and I'll show that to you. All right. I want to see that. Okay. that And that's consistent with the that value hierarchy discussion. If you guys are enjoying this, since we're going long today, give us a thumbs up and a an applause so Don Don gets a big head. <laughs> My hat size is already too big. <laughs> so I just touch these things to see where if I'm close. Uh, I encourage anybody that I work with to um, use caution when you're in the ex exploratory stage. If you're not quite sure what's going to land there, there's no need to mix up a big, huge puddle of paint and then have it be wrong. So I, I test it like this when I get into an area. And when I get when I think I got close and I say, OK, now I huh. now, now I can go. It's just it's just a matter of efficiency. Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful. I'm going to pull my other pull my other arm in here. Got my nice old Hughes easel I've had for a long time. Nice easels. Yeah, they it's kind of like buy an easel or buy a house. <laughs> I don't know, Eric. You're changing, helping me change my priorities. An easel and a sailboat sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. That is one thing that's just so enjoyable because I still sail a lot. And um, it's so fun to have my subject matter living and breathing, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, plus you're out, out in a summer day and it just – so I'm crafting my way through here because there are some tra tracings of foam in there. I'm, I'm probably be, being a little bit too fussy because I want to get the effect down. Probably should end up just taking the brush and swiping across it, but I want to. Well, you have fairly short summers up there where you are. So when you're sailing, you got to get it in while you can. You sure can. You sure do. That's why I hate leaving New England in August and September because it's the very best weather. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's when there's a lot of art events, but I turn a number of them down just so I can stay and sail and enjoy the season. Yeah. So yeah, is I'm that sure. is that illumination reading at all to you on the screen? Or? Yeah, it really is. It's really wow. fantastic. Okay, so we're coming up here where we should probably pull you back on screen and just say goodbye real quick. Okay, that's that fine. Is fantastic. Why don't you get the camera and do a little bit of a close-up of it? And then uh, give us a quick little studio tour, oh, sure. if, you're, if you're willing. And then, uh, then come back on camera and we'll say goodbye. Okay, good enough. I'll leave it at that. And, and uh, I, I can't do this most days because usually I'm tightly scheduled. So today we're able to do it. But uh, thank I'm you so for thank doing you, that, Mark. You're, you're such, a, such a gentleman to be uh, accommodating me that way. Uh, that is just stunning. So does that work? Yeah, that's going to look really great over my fireplace. I'm just saying. <laughs> Once I get that stuff you're sending me, I'll return it. To, I'll, I'll send yeah, right. It. I, think, I think I'd be getting the better end of that deal. <laughs>
All right, let's see your uh, your workspace here. Yeah, so this is a little studio that I built. It was an old garage. It's about 40 feet behind my house. I got a northern light right there. Here I've got a few of my maritime heroes. Chris Major painting. Wow. Let's see if we, Aldro Hibbard. Wow. Gordon Grant watercolor. Uh huh. That's the stuff I get to see. Wow, here's, that's beautiful. Here's a general panoramic view. Very nice. So you yeah. have a couple easels set up and a, oh, and a drawing board. A collection of matchbox trucks from when I was a boy. Oh, cool. <laughs> Very nice. They were okay, back on screen so everybody can see you. And uh, what else? I'll show you one more winter landscape and then I'll get oh, back. Okay. This is a winter landscape I'm working on right now. Oh, that's beautiful. Very nice. I think that's the tour. Semi clean. Oh, I didn't know you played guitar. I do. I strum. Yeah, I, so do I. I wouldn't call myself a guitar player, but I like to strum and sing. All right. Well, we have the, so now you now you have to come to the Adirondacks because we All have right. a, lot of, a lot of musicians. I'll bring my 20, 25 songs or so that I know and we can do something. Okay. I think Eric Koppel will probably come up. He usually does. Oh. Wilson comes up. Uh, I... I don't know. I'm trying to get C.W. Mundy up to play banjo, so we'll see. I know it's amazing how many there are. Kwong, of course, but Kwong, uh, yeah. they just give me some major and minor chords, and I can play rhythm. I'm perfectly content. <laughs> yeah, that's that's me too. I'm the rhythm guy. Well, Don, thank you so much for this. Uh, real quickly, one last time, I just want to tell everybody your website, which is uh, donalddemers.com. That's I've it. Got it on the screen. And from there, they can they can also find the American Academy. Of, what's tell me the name of it again? It's the American Academy of Landscape Painting. Okay. And it, it can be found on limeacademy.edu. Limeacademy.edu. Okay, terrific. I should also mention that Don and I did a video together. I posted it in the comments. If you want to go through there, if you want his video, uh, this is a, a nautical scene video, and so that would be good. I don't know if I have a picture of it in here. I probably don't. Well, Don, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. We're looking forward to having you on the staff or the staff. I don't like staff. The faculty of Plein Air Live. Uh, Don is going to be teaching on Plein Air Live in April, which is our virtual art conference. So uh, we'll go. We'll do something complete start to finish on that. So, Don, thank you so much. You are welcome, Eric. Thank you for your friendship, for your respect, and regarding the time and the audience you've given me. I really appreciate it. Uh, you're, you're my hero, so <laughs> I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you right, hang on, I'm going to talk to you after the broadcast. I'll be right back. Well, what a red-letter day to have Don Demers on and, and to have him come into Plein Air Live. It's, it's really a terrific day. So thank you guys for your patience and hanging in there longer. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, we have so much going on, so much to talk about, but I'm going to let you go today. Uh, just have a terrific day. Remember, this is day 321. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. I'm trying to be here for you guys. I know this whole lockdown thing worldwide is just crazy, and uh, we just got to do what we got to do and then get through it. But uh, this is here to kind of help you through it. I hope that's helping. Have a terrific day and uh, take care of yourself and uh, keep your head in the game. Bye-bye.